All right. Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight for Hatfield Museum and History Society May Community Program. I'm Larry Stevens, president of the Society. So once again, we are unable to meet in person for our presentation, but I'm so glad that we have this venue to continue to share with you some of Hatfield's wonderful history. A brief update on the new museum. It appears, of course, that we will need to delay our opening until our area gets to green zone status, whenever that may be. And just what our opening will look like is yet to be determined, but be assured, we want to get that new museum opened up to the public just as soon as possible. We'd certainly like as many people as possible to enjoy tonight's program, so if you're comfortable doing so, consider starting a watch party so that all of your friends can join us. If you're not familiar with watch parties, simply click on share and then click on watch party and it's that simple hopefully if you uh, would enjoy reading more of about hatfield's fascinating history we have a number of great books available on our website hatfieldhistory.org so check them out and finally if you would like to become a dues paying member of the society and help support the work of the society in preserving and presenting hatfield's history I encourage you to go to our website, hatfieldhistory.org, where you can find our membership information. All right, on with tonight's program. While my video technician adjusts the camera, let us know you're watching by sending us a quick comment. Go ahead, camera technician. Send us a quick comment and let us know you're watching. And feel free to comment throughout tonight's program. We love your feedback. So I'll wait till our video technician gives me the okay that everything's adjusted. We want to give you the best picture possible here with our high-tech equipment. Okay. So... Tonight's program is titled, This and That, An Eclectic Look at Hatfield History, Part 11. I presented our first This and That program back in January 2010 after looking through the Society's photo collection and realizing the, we, that we had a lot of nice photos that wouldn't quite fit in with a particular program, but I thought would be interesting to show. So I just put those pictures together into a program and called it This and That. So tonight is part 11, our 11th presentation of this and that. I'm going to start out the program this evening with some photos of a few houses that aren't around anymore. Uh, but if you've lived in Hatfield for a while, you're likely to remember them. These first pictures are from 1991 and show the Clayton Moyer Farm on 40 Foot Road near Welsh Road. The old farmhouse sat right about where the AutoZone Auto Parts store now sits. You can see Hatfield Packing in the background behind the house. The barn and other outbuildings sat right up against 40 Foot Road. These buildings were all soon demolished after these photos were taken. Then the ground remained undeveloped until around 2009 when construction of the Hatfield Point Shopping Center was started. This next house is probably not going to be as familiar even though it was torn down only about five years ago. But because it sat so far back from the road, it's likely you never even noticed it. It was located off of Bergy Road up near Bethlehem Pike. These photos were taken around 2015, shortly before the buildings were torn down. An industrial facility, electronic fluorocarbons, now sits on the property. Here's the barn. James Renner apparently owned it for many years, but perhaps uh, someone out there knows who owned it more recently. If so, feel free to let us know by commenting. This, this next house was quite visible 
sitting right at the intersection of Cowpath Road and Walnut Street up until 2015. It really looked quite naked once the trees were removed from the property. The house was torn down soon after this photo to make way for the Fortuna Crossing townhouse development. You may not recognize this building right away. It was built around 1930 and served as a general store for a number of years, selling candy, sodas, ice cream, cigarettes, and gasoline. Perhaps this next photo will help you identify where it is. If you're still not sure where it is, the street sign might give you a clue if you can make it out. It is the building that stood for many years at the corner of Bethlehem Pike and Orvilla Road. It belonged to Elwood Poppy Bardo, who continued to operate his Sunoco gas station here into his 80s. After he died, the building was sold and turned into a small restaurant for a brief time before closing for good in the mid-1980s. It sat vacant, vacant since then, and in its final years, was probably best known as the building that had the huge Hatfield Village Apartments sign on it. Bardo's was finally demolished in August of 2007. Another highly visible house, this one was located near the intersection of Bethlehem Pike and Broad Street in the village of Calmer. It was owned for many years by the Erdman family and was demolished around 2003 to make room for a development. Just north from there, on the other side of Broad Street, was the Calmer Auto Service Garage. This building apparently had its start as an Atlantic gasoline station, perhaps in the 1930s. In 1941, Paul B. Moser and Willard Spaniger took over the station as partners, and in 1944, Calmer Auto Service Inc. was established. In 1976, the business was being operated by Paul Moser and his son Paul, or Mose as he was known. Charles Smitty Smith was also a very well-known well mechanic for Calmer Auto for many years. The business continued until 2003, the year this photo was taken, when the property was purchased by a developer and the building soon raised. This is the Horace Berge Farm on Berge Road at the hatfield Satterton Pike intersection as it appeared in 2008, shortly before it was demolished. This is a great 2008 photo of Bergie's Pond, with the Bergie farmhouse, barn, and other outbuildings in the background. Back in simpler times, when the winter weather turned the water to ice, Bergie's Pond was always a popular place to enjoy some ice skating. This newspaper photo is from 1958. This last house is a rather nondescript little Cape Cod style house, although in rather poor condition. You might not recognize it from this photograph, but you likely will in this next one. This strange looking house was the home of Lady Shaw on Cowpath Road across from Snyder Square. When the Shaw brothers Isaac and Lady built the house in the mid-1950s, there was nothing unusual about the house at all. It was built on a small hill overlooking Lady Shaw's laundromat and car wash buildings to the north. When Shaw later added on a larger modern laundromat around 1980, I believe, additional parking was required so the land was leveled all around the house, exposing its basement walls to provide the needed parking space. The house sat, sat empty for many years before finally being demolished in August of 2006. I could probably, probably do a whole program 
on the houses that aren't here anymore, but I'm just not sure how interesting that would be. So I'm going to switch gears now from buildings that aren't around anymore to a few that are. This small building may look familiar to you. It sits on East Lincoln Avenue in Hatfield Borough, right next to the creek. It is currently a home, but in a past life, it served a much different purpose. It was Hatfield's print shop for over 45 years, where the Hatfield Times newspaper was printed, as well as other commercial printing. The first Hatfield print shop was established in the early 1880s by Dillman Lincoln Oberholzer Kolb, or more simply, DLO Kolb. Kolb started the business around 1883 at the young age of 18 in his father's feed mill store on South Main Street. If this building looks a bit familiar, it's because you probably have driven by it many times. It sits just to the left of Gotchel's auto service garage. Mr. Culp ran a print shop for about 11 years, uh, or he, he ran the print shop for about 11 years in various buildings in town. He sold the business in 1894, and it eventually came to be owned by Clinton R. Addison in 1899. In 1903, Mr. Addison moved his printing business into this building uh, that, the, that George S. Snyder had built on his East Lincoln Avenue property next to the Snyder Mansion. That building would have been located right about where the small cottage is now on the Paradise Manor property. So Mr. Addison ran his printing business here for a number of years, including the weekly Hatfield newspaper, which he called the Hatfield Times. Now I'm sure this building also looks quite familiar to you. Around 1912, the Lehigh Valley Transit Company purchased the building and had it moved to East Broad Street, where it sits today to serve as the Hatfield Trolley Station. Mr. Addison soon bought a small lot from Chester Knipe on East Lincoln Avenue, just west of the creek, on which he constructed this new building to house his printing business. Those are the trolley tracks running alongside of Lincoln Avenue. They were, they were removed soon after this photo was taken when the tracks were relocated. In 1917, Mr. Addison hired Harry E. Bruner to be editor and publisher of the Hatfield Times newspaper. Here's Addison and Bruner posing in front of their building that year, 1917. You can see that the tracks are no longer there and a new cement sidewalk has been installed. C.R. Addison soon got out of the printing business and sold it to Harry Bruner in 1920. This is a 1943 photo of the print shop. <clears throat> Mr. Brunner continued to run the print shop until 1955, the year this photo was taken, when he sold the business to Edward Bonnekemper II, owner of Bonnekemper Typesetting on Coffell Road. Bonnekemper, that same year, changed the name of the weekly newspaper to Penn Valley Times. In 1959, in order to more efficiently run the newspaper business, Bonnekemper moved the operation in with his typeset, typesetting business on Coffell Road and in 1960 began advertising the Lincoln Avenue property for sale. In November 1961, after six and a half years as publisher of the Penn Valley Times, Ed Bonnekemper stepped down and Howard Berger assumed the position of publisher of the paper. Berger was not with the newspaper long, and by January 1963, Bonnekemper was again publishing the newspaper. Later that year, Bonnekemper sold the newspaper but kept the printing business, 
to W.F. Gettler of Satterton. Mr. Gettler moved the newspaper business office back into its former home on Lincoln Avenue, although the actual printing was done in Satterton. The newspaper maintained the Lincoln Avenue office until about 1965 when the Penn Valley Times was purchased by the Satterton Independent newspaper. This is how the building looked in 1970. So now you know the hidden history behind this unusual small house on Lincoln Avenue. In 1916, Horace Davis opened a small luncheonette in the basement of the Hatfield Borough Schoolhouse at the corner of Main Street and Lincoln Avenue. From 1919 to 1922, he operated his business in the basement of D.L.O. Culp's building on East Lincoln Avenue. Now, Mr. Culp owned several buildings on East Lincoln, but I think it may have been in the one that was later, the Hatfield Tavern, and is now Hattrick Sports Bar. By 1922, Mr. Davis was able to build his own building at 102 East Broad Street, where he operated a restaurant, pocket billiards room, and news agency. Because his hands were often ink-covered due to the newspapers he handled, Davis received the nickname Inky. Here's Inky behind the counter, probably in the early 70s, ready to cheerfully wait on his next customer. Davis continued to run the business, most commonly known simply as Inky's, until his retirement around 1975, at which time his son Robert ran the business for a few years. The luncheonette was closed for good in 1978. Moving to South Hatfield, here's the oldest picture we have of the main hotel building at Main Street and Talmanson Avenue, which was taken around 1903. For many years, known simply as the South Hatfield Hotel, this building has been home to a hotel since it was constructed in 1867, 153 years, making it the oldest business in all of Hatfield. A closer look at the sign shows that Jesse B. Slaughterer was the proprietor at the time. Mr. Slaughterer was the proprietor from 1903 to 1923, so this photo could well have been taken soon after he took over the business. I'm guessing that could be him there on the left, with other members of his family posing to celebrate the occasion. Here's another great photo of the South Hatfield Hotel, taken around the same time, 1903. This is a few years later, maybe around 1913. It was quite common back in those days to hold political rallies at the local ta hotel tavern, and that appears to be what was happening here. I believe this must have been the Hatfield Democratic Convention, since a donkey figure appears on the bunting at the bottom right corner. And here's a couple of convention attendees posing next to the tracks. Unfortunately, we have no idea who these men are. This photo is from around 1915, and you can see that Mr. Slaughter decided that instead of the building just being known as Slaughter's Hotel, he now called it the Keystone Hotel. And here we are looking up Main Street from the railroad tracks. The house on the right, some of you Hatfield longtimers may recall, was the home of John and Amanda Fossbender from 1927 to 1970. Here's a November 1970 photo of the Fossbender home across from the South Hatfield Hotel. At that time, it was one of the oldest homes in the borough and might possibly at one time have served as a toll house on the Cowpath Road. 
Lillian May Keck Lewis was born here in this house in January 1879, and that is her grandson, Donald Lewis, checking out the house one last time before it was to be demolished. Soon after it was gone, the Sunshine Ice Cream Shop was built on the site. We're going through a pretty scary time right now with the coronavirus, but back in the middle part of the 20th century, few diseases frightened parents more than polio. Polio struck in the warm summer months, sweeping through towns in epidemics every few years. Though most people recovered quickly from polio, some suffered te temporary or permanent paralysis and even death. Many polio survivors were disabled for life. They were a visible, painful reminder to society of the enormous toll this disease took on young lives. Here in Hatfield, in this 1963 photo, Hatfield JC members tally up the contributions made during a polio inoculation event. On the right is Leon Lee Julius, and on the left is Richard Cardell. Here's some folks filling out registration cards for the polio inoculation. Seated at the table is Debbie Julius. The others are so far unidentified. This is a rather unique house here in Hatfield Borough that probably mostly goes unnoticed. It is located at 119 East Vine Street between Main Street and the bridge. The house was built in the early 1900s by Henry Groth and his son, John S. Groth. The house features beautiful, intricate plaster work in the columns and trim. The molds for the unique original designs under the porch roof were made by Henry Groth. Here's John Groth, a carpenter by trade, and his wife Lillian, posing next to their home around 1940. The couple lived in the house up until around 1949. Many of you will remember when the parking lot behind the trolley stop looked like this, this picture from around 1970. Notice that it was taken before the addition to the trolley stop was built. Here's a newspaper photo from 1972 showing the new addition to the trolley stop. You can see that at that time there was an entrance to the store directly from the Broad Street sidewalk. And they were open seven days a week from 7 a.m. until midnight. Here's the trolley stop's trolley, trolley car snack stand. This mock Liberty Bell trolley car sat next to the trolley stop deli from 1981 until 2006. The trolley served as an ice cream stand for five years, but it didn't prove to be practical. The trolley sat unused for many years until 2006 when it was donated to the Culpsville Lions Club. The club had plans to fix up the 25-year-old trolley and use it in parades and other events. But that apparently never happened, and the trolley was last seen parked on the street next to Matera's scrapyard in Lansdale, waiting to be scrapped. <clears throat> These three young ladies are celebrating Independence Day 1953 in Atlantic City, the summer before they began their senior year at Hatfield High School. Of course, they are only posing for a novelty picture and not in an actual bar. These members of the Hatfield High School class of 1954 are left to right, Joan Flack McMullen, Arlene Gerhard Whalen, and Joan Daly Concanon. While I understand that it was not uncommon to hook up goats to carts and wagons in years gone by, 
I imagine that this particular ride was quite a head turner. This photo of one cool goat was taken at the Hatfield Fairgrounds in 1934. Seen here are Lee Weber, Merle Weber standing in the back, and Richard Weber. This is one of the shelters that the Hatfield school system had located at bus stops around the township during the 20s and 30s. They provided bad weather protection for the kids while waiting for Pop Delp's school bus to pick them up. This building was located on the, on the corner of the Afjes property on the northeast corner of Coffell and Orvilla Road. On the left edge of this photo, you can see a small piece of the former Orvilla one-room schoolhouse. The kids seen here waiting for the bus are, left to right, Annie Hilpert, Rosemary Hilpert, Jeannie Eberhardt, and Betty Griswold. Since the Hatfield Chamber of Commerce was formed back in 1927, it has been helping to spread holiday cheer to the sick and aged of Hatfield. For many years, food baskets were delivered by dedicated members of the chamber. Here's a December 1961 newspaper photo showing volunteers preparing to make their deliveries. They are from left, Erwin Aukey, Leyden Berge standing in the back, Harry Brunner, Miss Ella Gotchel, Raymond Alabach standing in the back, Mrs. Naomi Markley, and Mrs. Helen Frankenfield. There was a time when there was no fewer than five garages in Hatfield Borough where you could stop and get your gas tank filled. And while you waited, they would also check your oil, clean your windshield, and if desired, have your radiator filled and tire pressure checked. One of them was Grimley's Texaco Station on South Main Street. Laverne Grimley operated this station here from 1942 to 1953. More of you probably, probably remember the station when it was operated by Johnny Swartz from 1953 to 1980. This, of course, is now Victor's Auto. Here's Botch Nolan at Johnny Swartz's garage in the late 1950s. Now, I'm sure some of you out there are like me and have fond memories of the sound of the driveway signal bell that would summon the attendant when you pulled your car in over the black hose at the pumps. Occasionally I'll, occasionally I'll hear that bell while watching an old TV show and it really takes me back. I hope you don't mind if I throw in one more farmhouse that isn't here anymore. It was located on Cowpath Road at Township Line Road, right across from the Walter Farmhouse. And look at all that open farmland. It's not a great photo, but it's the only known photo of this Hatfield Township farmhouse. Elihu B. Moyer owned this property from 1904 to 1958. He apparently turned the farm over to his son Norman at some point. In 1958, the farm was sold to the Kenzies, who owned it until around 1970, when the farmhouse and the barn were torn down to make way for the power lines. This is the Moyer barn. Some of you long timers may recall that for many years after the barn was torn down, maybe more than 30 years, the silo remained standing there in the field like a tombstone for the farm. Patriotic Order Sons of America, founded in 1847, is one of America's oldest patriotic and fraternal societies. This photo shows the men of the Hatfield Patriotic Order Sons of America lined up in front of the Hatfield Borough School Building at Main Street and Lincoln Avenue, taken sometime in the early 1900s. It's great that the Detwaller family was 
so diligent in photographing the evolution of their store at Broad and Market Streets. The general store was first built and operated here in 1874. It changed hands a number of times until January 1908, when Isaac C. Detweiler purchased it. This photo was probably taken soon after the 1908 purchase, and that is apparently their home delivery vehicle on the left. It's interesting to note the way he spelled his name at that time, which changed at some point. Here's a picture from the inside of the store taken around 1912. Left to right are Willard Detweiler, son of the owner, Clark Abe Fretz, Isaac Detweiler, Sarah Albright, and Florence Texter. It looks to me like this was half the store with additional merchandise available through the doorway to the right of the women. Notice the painted stripe on the ceiling. The store space was really opened up by the time this picture was taken a few years later. A new refrigerated dairy case was a great asset for the business. Notice the fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables on the left. Mr. Detweiler kept a pig pen with two pigs back behind the store who got to enjoy any unsaleable fresh produce. This photo shows the store in the early 1940s. Notice that they had by then upgraded to fluorescent light fixtures, the latest innovation in electrical lighting. Also notice the large spool of butcher string hanging from the ceiling on the right. Here's an outside photo of the store taken in 1943. At this time, the store was a member of the North Penn Stores Association, which supplied groceries and put out a weekly circular to help promote its members. Three years later, in 1946, I.C. Detweiler died at the age of 73, and his son Gilbert carried on the store business. In 1947, the store was extensively remodeled. Here's a couple of identified young guys helping out with the project. And here's a recent Hatfield High School graduate, Samuel Benner, in his Hatfield Hatter t-shirt, taking a break from his labors. Here's another unidentified young worker taking a break from the renovation project. When the store reopened in August 1947, it was as a member of the Economy Stores organization of 325 grocers. A newspaper advertisement boasted modern food market, brilliant lighting, Gondolas, new refrigeration equipment, new modern shelving, new mirror-back produce department, new merchandise. Everything is new. More than 1,000 people attended the reopening event. On January 7, 1957, a fire occurred in the basement of the store. Although the fire company was able to limit the fire damage, there was serious smoke damage to the entire building and the store's inventory and contents were completely wiped out. Gilbert saw this as an opportunity to modernize the store to a self-service market. In 1970, Gilbert Detweiler made the decision to close the store that was a borough institution for almost 100 years. He said, I need a new freezer and refrigerator units and modern fixtures. And with the trend to later hours, it's just too much for a small independent store. So at the end of business on Christmas Eve day, 1970, after 62 years of operation, Detweiler's Market closed its doors forever.
the store's inventory was liquidated and the store property was sold to the Hatfield Savings and Loan Association next door. The store building was soon demolished to make room for a parking lot for the savings and loan. This May 1950 newspaper photo shows some of the Hatfield Joint Consolidated School's 7th grade students who presented a puppet show at the annual May exhibit. From left to right are Ronald Landis, Ralph Schwartz, Alfred Kober, Robert Sellers, and Frank Javorka. <clears throat> the Hatfield Lions Club has been sponsoring its annual Easter egg hunt for 72 years. In this circa 1958 photo, a crowd gathers in front of the Hatfield Firehouse on Broad Street in anticipation of that year's egg hunt. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Once the crowd was assembled, cars carrying the Easter goodies would lead a procession up to the field behind the school where the egg hunt took place. Here's the parade. Here the parade is seen traveling up Main Street, passing West School Street. In 1950, one of the single most influential technical developments in blood banking occurred with the introduction of the plastic bag for blood collection. Replacing breakable glass bottles with durable plastic bags allowed for the evolution to a safe and easy blood collection system. Then in the mid-1950s, with open heart surgery occurring more frequently to treat cardiac conditions, the need for blood donors exploded. On February 14, 1957, Valentine's Day, 65 people participated in a Hatfield Fire Company sponsored blood typing program. Seen here, standing in line waiting to get their blood type cards are right to left, Isaac Fusner, Abraham Rittenhouse, Harry E. Brunner, Howard Buffington, and Charles Illingsworth, Jr. At the end of the line is Walter Kopp, waiting to have a blood sample taken. <clears throat> Next week, we will observe Memorial Day, and unfortunately, it has been necessary to cancel the annual Hatfield Parade. Memorial Day parades and services have been held in Hatfield since the 1930s. The Lansdale American Legion organized these, these events until 1944 when the Hatfield Chamber of Commerce Memorial Committee took over the responsibility. In 1947, the newly established Hatfield Legion assumed the responsibility of hosting the Hatfield Memorial Day parades and services. In its early years, the parade lineup would start at Main and Vine Streets and travel to the War Memorial on the train station lawn for the Remembrance Ceremony. Here's the Hatfield Fire Company around 1955 lining up for the parade. And here's the Cub Scouts getting started on their journey up Main Street. After the parade, the crowd would gather in front of the train station at the War Memorial to remember those who lost their lives in military service of their country. After the 21-gun salute, the crowd would move down behind the Hatfield Firehouse for refreshments provided by the Hatfield Chamber of Commerce. This photo shows the crowd gathered after the 1958 parade lining up to enjoy ice-cold birch beer on tap along with pretzels. Of course, that's the former trolley station on the right. <clears throat> In 
That's Hatfield Chamber of Commerce Secretary Jake Frankenfield in the center with the white shirt, offering Hatfield Borough Police Chief Herb Kreider a cold drink. I believe that's Layden Berge next to Jake Frankenfield and perhaps J. Walter Snyder on the right. If you know who the officer is on the far left, let me and everyone else know by sending us a comment. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's Lloyd Wagner on the left receiving a plaque in, re in recognition of his 44 years as treasurer for Hatfield Borough. That's Council President Gordon Grubb making the presentation in this July 1976 photo. Mr. Wagner would go on to serve a total of 50 years as borough treasurer before retiring. Now that's commitment. This photo shows 1944 Hatfield High School senior, Elsie Hiller, posing in front of the school. Some of you may remember her as Elsie Garahan. The Grecian bench and sundial seen here were gifts to the school from the class of 1927. Here's a picture showing the front of the school with the home economics cottage there on the right. And again, you see the bench and sundial in front of the school. Behind the building, kids could take advantage of the school's state-of-the-art playground. It featured this great swing set and a tennis court in the background. There was also a metal sliding board that was sure to give you third-degree burns on those hot summer days. Some seesaws, and I think those are the same seesaws that I played on in the late 1960s. And behind the seesaw, there was something called the ocean wave. For those not familiar with the ride, here's an advertisement for the ocean wave. Now that looks safe. What could go wrong? I can't imagine why these aren't on every playground today. And who out there remembers when the, they had the large concrete sewer pipes? set up in a circle back in the 60s and 70s for kids to run through. But that was back when kids had thick skulls and could handle the occasional concussion. Those days are long gone. I'm often surprised by what photos posted on Facebook get the most response. This simple snapshot photo showing the Melody Brook ice skating rink in Calmer being flooded following a 1971 rainstorm brought a very high comment count as folks enjoyed sharing their memories of time spent there. Here's another view showing the flash flooding that occurred that day. And sadly, these are the only two pictures we have of the popular ice skating rink. Here's a newspaper ad for the rink. Melody Brook opened in 1966 and operated until around 2005 when it closed down. For those, those who may be newer to the area, the building is now occupied by Produce Junction. <coughs> this photo from back in January also got a good response from our Facebook followers. It was of the house on Bethlehem Pike in Lane, Lexington, that was recently demolished. One of the small original windows and the chimney pot, that's the white cement extension on top of the chimney, were saved from demolition and donated to the society. Another one of our most popular posts, surprisingly, was this one showing Edna Benner, hard at work, hand-pulling her taffy-like slap, slapjack. Mrs. Benner got the Pennsylvania Dutch hard candy recipe in 1959 from a woman she knew at church. Slapjack candy begins by making a syrup out of molasses, brown sugar, water, 
and a bit of margarine. Wintergreen, licorice, or root beer flavoring is added, and then the mixture is poured onto a marble slab to cool. Once the mixture is cooled enough, it is put on a meat hook hanging from the ceiling and pulled until it is the right color and consistency, which is what Edna Bender is doing in this photo. Once the candy reaches the correct state, it is transferred to a table where it is rolled into a snake, cut into small pieces, and finally rolled in confectioner's sugar. Many Hatfield long-timers will remember Edna Benner's Busy Bees Market, a roadside stand next to her home on 40-foot road, just west of Coffell Road. There you could buy fruits and vegetables, pies and homemade root beer, and of course, slapjack. Edna Benner died in 1996, but her daughter continues to make the hard, chewy candy in honor of her mother, keeping alive this 61-year-old Hatfield tradition. Another simple snapshot that received many comments was this one of Heston Swartley's gas station on Penn Street. Many folks enjoyed sharing their memories of getting gas and oil there for many years. Some of our more senior friends might even remember that before it was Swartley's gas station, the building was home to Wellington Moyers Penn Food Market back in the early 1950s. That in addition to gas, also sold milk, bread, and other food staples. Some of you may also remember the tiny building that sat nearby next to the railroad that was home to Calvin Grafton's piano and organ store. Going back to the village of Calmer, I believe this is one of the oldest pictures we have of that village taken around 1905. And I believe that it was taken from West Walnut Street, looking south on Bethlehem Pike towards the railroad crossing. Back then, of course, East Walnut Street didn't intersect with Bethlehem Pike where it does today. It intersected just north of the railroad crossing. Another nice old picture from Calmer from around the same time, this one looking north on Bethlehem Pike from the railroad. West Walnut Street runs between the first and second house on the left. So the second house, for those familiar with Calmer, has been the home of Catherine Carver Candies for many, many years. Notice that Bethlehem Pike was quite rustic in that time. This is the same area a number of years later, perhaps the mid-1950s. Looks like sidewalks were just put in along Bethlehem Pike. And here's a more recent photo showing what those two first two houses look like today. Unfortunately, the only notation on the back of this photo was Calmer, PA. Some accompanying materials found with this photo seems to indicate that it may have been taken around 1916, but it's unknown what house is pictured or whether the path shown was a road, a lane, or a driveway. I sure wish we had more information, but it's one of those pictures that I'm sure will always remain a mystery. From the early beginnings of Hatfield Township, policing was done by constables, working when necessary on their own time, more or less. One of the township's first constables was Harold Graham, who began serving in 1930. In 1936, Graham was made a part-time township police officer. And when the township officially established its police department in 1950, Graham was made the chief, although he was still the only officer and still only part-time. In 1954, two part-time patrolmen were added to the department, 
Chief Graham was made full-time, and the first police car was purchased. This photo, taken around 1961, shows Chief Graham sitting in the township police car. When Chief Graham retired from the Hatfield Police Department in 1964, Irving Thompson served for a short time as acting supervisor for the police department. In this photo, Thompson poses with two newly hired full-time officers, Warren Horrocks and Richard Duplessis. Thompson was soon replaced by Robert Turner as chief. This photo, taken in the decorated gymnasium of the Hatfield Consolidated School, shows an unnamed student portraying the 1949 New Year's, e New Year's baby. If you recognize him, let us know by sending us a comment. Here's a photo from way back in 1979, 41 years ago. It shows little seven-year-old Kathy O'Shea posing with her trophy after being named Little Miss Hatfield, 1979. This mid-1950s newspaper advertisement is for Burgoyne's Food Market, which was located on Unionville Pike, not far from Bethlehem Pike. Sadly, George Burgoyne met a tragic death at the age of 45 while, while making a delivery in Philadelphia. He had an order of meat in the back of his panel truck but he, which he apparently kept cold with dry ice. When he got to his destination, he entered the back of his truck to obtain the meat when a gust of wind blew the door closed. With no means to open the door from the inside, he soon died of carbon dioxide poisoning from the dry ice. Eventually, two of Burgoyne's acquaintances who worked in the area noticed the truck parked with the keys in the outside lock. They opened it to find the victim lying on his back with his feet against the door as if he had tried to kick it open. Mr. Burgoyne was survived by a wife, three sons, and a daughter. All right, next I want to tell you about a tragic incident that occurred in Hatfield that nobody knows about. It's not recorded in any Hatfield history book, and I didn't even learn about it until just last week. And I'm always excited to learn something new about Hatfield's history. I was doing some research on a totally unrelated subject when I came across a book titled Partial History of the Freed Family and Connecting Families. It was written in 1923 by Jacob A. Freed of Elroy, at the age of 72. To help write the book, he enlisted the assistance of his childhood school teacher, Abraham S. Rosenberger, who at that time was 80 years old and a very prominent borough uh, resident of Hatfield Borough. In the book, Mr. Rosenberger recalled a cold winter morning on February 2nd, 1865, when while teaching at a one-room schoolhouse just south of Moorwood, Franconia Township, the windows and shutters and the whole schoolhouse shook as if it was struck by an earthquake. He later learned that at 9.48 that morning, a steam locomotive pulling a freight train through Hatfield exploded with a force that could be felt for miles around. The familiar and powerful Cheltenham-style locomotive exploded near the Orvilla Station on the North Penn branch of the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad, midway between the Hatfield and Lansdale stations. The engine boiler explosion occurred directly over the large fireplace, forcing all the remaining hot water and steam from that overheated cauldron into the terrible bed of fire beneath making the explosion many times more frightful. The terrible explosion left men lying dead, disfigured beyond recognition. 
Others were badly scalded and burned by the steam, red-hot coals, and cinders that were forced by the explosion into their flesh. They were found writhing in terrible agony. The dead and the wounded were soon carried to a nearby residence, coincidentally that of the uncle of Mr. Rosenberger, until arrangements could be made for them. Five men were killed instantly in the explosion, including the engineer, two firemen, and two others who, according to a railroad accident report, quote, were hiding or riding on the tender contrary to the rules of the road, end quote. Two others were badly burned, although both recovered, except that the conductor never did, did regain his eyesight. So that is the story of the previously unknown tragic train explosion of 1865. Since we are a week away from Memorial Day, I thought I would wrap up this evening's program with a group of aerial photos taken on Memorial Day, 1970, 50 years ago. If you are a Hatfield long-timer, these pictures should really take you back. If you're newer to Hatfield, they will give you a flavor of what the area was like 50 years ago. These photographs were taken by Society member Ray Masser while flying around over Hatfield with pilot Herb Flossdorf. This first photo shows the area of Broad and Market Street and Lincoln Avenue. Knipes Hotel was gone for some time by 1970. It was demolished eight and a half years earlier on December 29, 1961. In its place is a Sunoco service station, which was most recently the corner sweet shop. Across the street, Detweiler's general store will be in business for only another six months before it closes its doors forever and then soon demolished. And there's the, Hat the new Hatfield Post Office building, which was built in 1962. As I mentioned, these photos were taken on Memorial Day, 1970. In this photo, you can see that the firehouse doors are up as the firemen prepared to participate in the Memorial Day parade. Behind the firehouse, members of the Hatfield Chamber of Commerce are setting up the refreshment area for where all the children will go after the parade and service to enjoy some birch beer and pretzels. And there's the Trolley Stop convenience store, which opened in 1965 in the old Hatfield Trolley Station, under the co-ownership of Raymond Reds McGinn and Hatfield pharmacist Robert Porter, offering groceries and dairy products. They are just a couple of years away from building the addition to the store. Business for the Hanson Textile Company was so good that in 1966, they built a three-story addition to their building. Angelo and Caroline Giardino took over the small local tavern on Lincoln Avenue in 1962, and it became a meeting place where community members would gather to catch up on the day's gossip. Two years after this photo was taken, Mike and Lucia Butera took over the Hatfield Tavern business. The building is now Hattrick's Sports Bar and Grill. Some of you will remember that behind the tavern was the Hatfield Car Wash. And in, this, and in this photo, it looks like someone is washing their car, perhaps making sure it's nice and shiny for the parade. All right, now, how many of you remember Mabel's Luncheonette or Dilworth's Luncheonette on Main Street? Go ahead and comment if you remember. Do you see it there? It's at the top right corner. No? Let's zoom in then. There it is. Sadly, it's, this is the only known photo we have of the luncheonette. Mabel Jordan owned and operated Jordan's luncheonette, more commonly known as just Mabel's, 
at 141 South Main Street from 1957 to 1970, at which time it became Dilworth's Luncheonette, with Florence Dilworth Rohrbach the owner. Known to most as simply Flossies, the Luncheonette operated until the mid-1980s, and later was home to Dominic's Pizza, owned by Ed Van, Arms Van Arsdale. The building was demolished around 1995. Two houses that once stood next to the former, former Heidelberg Church have been torn down to make room for a new convenience store here in Hatfield Borough, the Open Pantry. Apartment buildings are now springing up throughout the area. The Meadowbrook Apartments are at the top of the picture, and right below, the Meadowbrook West Apartments are under construction. That's Brooks Instruments on West Vine Street in the center of the picture. Brooks moved to Hatfield Borough from Lansdale in 1957. So for 63 years, they have been operating here in the borough. Right above Brooks is the Village Scene Trailer Park, which was established in 1950 by Raymond and James Allabach. Way in the distance in the top left corner is Hatfield Packing. Here's West Broad Street looking towards the borough with the remnants of the Hatfield racetrack there on the left. The last race was held on September 24th, 1966, almost four years before this picture was taken. And then the speedway was soon demolished by the new owner, Raymond Rosenberger. That's Market Street there on the left running parallel to the railroad tracks. Another apartment building, the Hat House Apartments, has just been built on North Market Street. In the far background, the new estate of George S. Snyder complex is under construction and would open in March 1971. This view is from West Vine Street looking north. That's Didden Greenhouses in the bottom right corner. To help you get oriented, that's Wayne Avenue and that's West Broad Street. The new Hatfield Elementary School, which opened a few months later, is in the background. Here's Main Street looking north from Vine Street. There's the J.C. Creeble Funeral Home at the corner of Main and Vine Street at the bottom left. The Hatfield Funeral Home was started in 1917 by Ziegler Cope. Here's what that building looked like back around 1910. Zig Cope ran the funeral business until his death in 1957, and then his nephew Jay Creeble took over the business. Jay ran the business until his tragic death in an auto accident in December 1975, at which time his wife Rose took over the business. There's Johnny Swartz's Texco station that I have previously talked about. Again, Mr. Swartz was the owner of the station from 1953 until 1980. And there's the house of John and Amanda Fossbender that was previously discussed. And across the street, of course, is the main hotel. Here's the Borough Electric Plant. Hopwood Brothers. And the Hatfield Borough Public Works Garage. Here are the first six buildings of the Hatfield Village apartment complex on Maple Avenue, built on the former Chester Knight Farm. There are now 35 buildings in the complex. And here's another view of the new Hatfield Village apartments.
This is Emmert's Scrapyard on Richmond Road in Hatfield Township. Emmert's has operated on this site since the mid-1950s. And this view would not be much different today, except that most of the fields at the top right of the photo are now parking lots for the cold storage business on Berge Road. Here's another large apart apartment complex in the township, the Penfield Manor Apartments. And there's the Wally Durstein Farm, uh, Durstein Farm uh, there on the right. And that's Penfield Junior High School in the back. Here's a closer look at the Penfield Manor Apartments now known as Montgomery Manor. I always enjoy seeing the old farmhouses in these old aerial photos, although sad that they are gone now. That's the Penfield Manor apartments in the front, the former racetrack, of course, on the right, and in the back is the new round Hatfield Elementary School. In front of the school are the former Hatfield Livestock Auction Buildings. And there's that nice old farmhouse again, awaiting demolition in the near future. Here's the Oak Grove Trailer Park to orient yourself. This is Cowpath Road and there's Durstein Road. And there's St. Maria Goretti Church. And a lot of open farm fields in this picture. Looking straight down Cowpath Road from Township Line Road towards the borough. That's the former Walter Farm at the bottom center. This was taken from Berge Road, looking down Cowpath Road towards the borough. That's Beach Street coming up from the bottom left-hand corner. Also from Berge Road, a slightly different view, that's Diamond Street on the left and Beach Street on the right. And the abandoned old trolley right-of-way is running up between them. Here's another look at the Village Scene Trailer Park on Coffle Road in 1970. That's Brooks Instrument at the top of the picture with Farview Avenue just below Brooks. Here's Village Scene from a different angle from West Vine Street looking towards 40 Foot Road. That's Brooks at the lower right corner with Farview Avenue to the left of Brooks. There's Rosenberger's Dairies. And next door, of course, is the new Dairy Wagon building that opened that year, 1970. That's East Vine Street running across the bottom of the picture. And there's the Hatfield Community Pool on the left. The pool was only four years old when this photo was taken. Here's the new Hatfield Elementary School again that was opened a few months later. It was built on the former Falcarelli farmland. There's Fairgrounds Road before it was relocated to eliminate the two sharp 90 degree bends in the road. Remember when I talked about those concrete sewer pipes that passed for playground equipment back in the 60s and 70s? Well, there they are. Well, let's take a closer look. There they are. The only known photo of the cement pipe playground to remember them by. This is the Hatfield American Legion home on Coffle Road. That's Penfield Drive running through the middle of the picture. 
For many years, after the kids had enjoyed their refreshments behind the firehouse, adults were invited to the Legion home for refreshments. Now, the parade starts at the War Memorial and ends at the Legion, where a moving tribute is held, followed by a delicious luncheon for the whole family. We trust that this wonderful Hatfield tradition will be able to continue again in 2021. And that's all, folks. Well, I hope you enjoyed tonight's program. Again, thanks so much for, for uh, tuning in and, and watching it. And I hope to see you all real soon when the museum opens. Have a good night.